I want to talk about what defines a team. A team are people working together with a shared mental model, SMM, uh, using language that's standardized so they understand each other, and speaking in an environment where you're free to speak up without fear of reprisal. In other words, you communicate uh, with each other about whatever you want to communicate and address it in a way that's constructive rather than destructive. So the bottom line is we think that we're all part of a dream team that includes all of you. So um, pat yourselves on the back, don't hurt yourselves. Um, I'm Steve Bynes, I'm one of the surgeons who works at Rush and we're going to talk about the surgical management of melanoma. The goal is to review the essentials of the biopsy report. It's already been done for me, but I'll hit on it very quickly. It's to highlight the information the surgeon uses from that biopsy report to answer questions about prognosis and to create a treatment plan that's specific to your uh, tumor. I want to give an example of how the information is passed along. I'm going to sort of fall into my um, surgeon talking mode, remembering we're part of the same team, so you can get a feel for how we communicate about the, the surgery that you're going to have and how it relates back to your pathology report. And then we're going to review the apples and oranges phenomena, which I'll save for the last slide. For those of you I've taken care of, I think I've talked about this with each of you, and it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, there we go. Okay. So all surgical consultations begin with the biopsy report. You have to have that for the surgeon to know what uh, you're dealing with. You want to make sure it's a melanoma. If it's a melanoma, you want to know if it's invasive or not. If it's invasive, you want to know how deep it is. You want to know if there's ulceration. So if you come and see a surgeon without a pathology report, you can meet, you can have a physical examination, but you really can't get down to the nuts and bolts of the encounter unless you have the pathology report. The next thing you want to do is to ask for a review of the material as a surgeon. I like to have Dr. Reddy cover my back, and she's done that for me for uh, 15 years. A great example is getting uh, a melanoma report that says the lesion is four millimeters thick. Uh, do you guys remember that thickness is important, and the thicker the lesion, the worse the lesion? Four millimeter thick lesion, as Dr. Rhodes pointed out, is a pretty dangerous lesion. If it's a 0.4 millimeter thick melanoma, it's not terribly dangerous, and it's much more likely to be cured with simple surgery. And I've had cases where I've seen reports say four millimeters, it's been reviewed and come back 0.4 millimeters. I think it's a typo, not a mistake on the part of the pathologist. But things like that can get through the system. And since we're all part of the same team, we want to make sure we get uh, those kind of reviews whenever possible. And it takes time. So if you're in a hurry uh, to get your consultation, get your surgery done, get back on the road, I'm going to say let's slow down at a day or two to get this review. It's extremely important. So the essential information includes tumor thickness. I've got to have that. The presence or absence of ulceration and the mitotic index. If the report doesn't have that, I've got to get that information. But let's assume the biopsy's been done, it's excisional, which means the whole thing is removed. I have a report that includes all this information. I've got my back covered by Dr. Reddy, so we're ready to start our um, consultation. So how do I use tumor thickness? Uh, it needs to be measured in millimeters. I use that to answer questions about prognosis. I use it to craft uh, your surgical intervention. I need to know whether ulceration is present or not because it shades some of the surgical decision making that we go through, which I will talk about in a minute. I want to know the mitotic index for the same reason. It shades what I do, which means it moves me to one surgical approach versus another, depending on whether or not a lesion is ulcerated or has a high mitotic index. The integration of this information is how the surgeon figures out what surgical treatment you use, you need, gives the surgeon the information to answer questions about your prognosis, and it's essential that this be the starting point that we uh, work from as a team taking care of your melanoma. And by the way, you have uh, perfect right during these consultations to ask questions. Many people have gone to the internet and read, many people have had friends who have given them advice, and it's great to distill all that stuff down into what your clinician thinks is real. Uh, that touches on the apples and oranges phenomena, which we'll get to in a minute. So the surgical treatment of melanoma addresses the three things melanomas can do that a surgeon can interact with. The first thing a melanoma can do is come back locally where it's growing on the skin. Think dandelion and golf course. If you don't get the roots, it may come back. The next thing melanomas can do is spread to the lymph nodes. We have to address whether or not your tumor has spread to the lymph nodes. Third thing melanomas can do is spread throughout the body. We sit across the desk and we talk about these three things, dealing with local recurrence, dealing with whether or not it's spread to the lymph nodes, dealing with whether or not it has spread anywhere else in your body besides the primary tumor site or the lymph node site. 
These are the three things that a surgeon can interact with that you'll talk about, and these are the three things that are addressed in your surgical plan. Let's talk about wide excision first. Wide local excision of the tumor site is done to prevent local recurrence, and I'm going to touch on a theme that repeats itself over and over again in this process. If you guys all, I'll have to remember to turn. Um, maybe if I stood over here, it would be better. So, you can still hear me? Uh, wide local excision done to prevent local recurrence. How wide do we go? Do we take your whole uh, arm off? Do we take, uh, does the surgeon have to uh, do something quite radical or is it a simple operation? The theme I was talking about is the thicker a melanoma gets, the more dangerous it is and surgery escalates slightly as tumor thickness increases. So we use that tumor thickness to tell us what to do. These are the rules. If a melanoma is in situ, does everybody remember what an in situ lesion is? Dr. Reddy just talked about that it's above that basement membrane, the epidermis, highly curable. The excision for that lesion must be a five millimeter margin. This is established by a number of prospective randomized trials done in the United States and Europe. And we stick to those principles when we're offering up your surgical plan and making our decisions about what to do. If your melanoma is invasive, that means it breaks through the basement membrane, goes into the um, dermis. The depth at which it's inv invaded, when Dr. Reddy looks at the slide, tells us how wide we should go. For melanomas, up to one millimeter thick. Remember, that's a millimeter below uh, the granular layer of the epidermis. We take a one centimeter margin, which is about um, a half an inch. Now that means one centimeter if you come with a scar from all directions of that scar. If you still have a pigmented lesion present, we measure it from the edge of the pigmented lesion. And the uh, width uh, changes when you have a melanoma greater than one millimeter thick. We add another centimeter. So we do a two centimeter margin, which is close to an inch. Now in most parts of the body, we can get this accomplished and bring the skin together without a skin graft. It's not terribly dramatic surgery. I'm, uh, sad to say, because you can't look at me and think I'm a surgical genius. It's fairly straightforward. We can get things closed without a skin graft. It's done as an outpatient. It's done under local anesthesia, sometimes with sedation, sometimes not. And that is the surgical approach to the primary lesion to control local recurrence. Okay, so that's class one of melanoma school. Then class two, how deep do we go? Do we have to go into muscle? Can we go down to the layer that covers the muscle? Can we go just into the fat that lays underneath the dermis? The principle that we all stick to is it's a full thickness excision. It includes the skin, which is epidermis and dermis, and subcutaneous tissue down to but not through muscles. So we don't take major nerves, we don't take major blood vessels unless they happen to be running in the skin or subcutaneous tissue in the area we're trying to excise. So the question of how deep is deep? Down to but not through fascia. And that's the standard that's out there in the literature. And this has been looked at in a number of different studies. So that's the answer to width. That's the answer to depth. And I'll tell you, in most situations, this can be accomplished without skin grafts or without fancy flaps. That's not to say there aren't areas where the surgery becomes more dramatic. Tip of the nose. Now, on me, it's not hard to get a two centimeter margin. But on some of you, it may be difficult. So the face is an area where we have to compromise. The hands and feet are an area where we have to compromise. But these are the principles. Okay, so we've done our local, wide local excision. Now we have to assess the lymph nodes. There's a long and rich surgical history about what to do uh, for the lymph nodes in patients with melanoma. We're not going to go into that. I'd be happy to talk about uh, some of these subtleties with you later. Uh, surgeons can babble about this for a whole day, believe it or not. Uh, we're fairly boring when it comes to dissecting our um, information, but we want to know whether or not the tumor is spread to the lymph nodes. Again, this principle I've talked about, thickness. The thickness of your tumor determines whether or not we think the risk of the tumor having spread to your lymph nodes justifies going after the lymph nodes. One little insight into history. Uh, ten years ago, to look at the lymph nodes, we had to do a complete lymph node dissection, which is a pretty big operation, and particularly in terms of the problems you may have after the surgery with leg swelling, arm swelling, or problems with the neck. But about 10, 14 years ago, a technique was developed called sentinel node biopsy. Anybody here heard of that? Read about it? Okay, well, I'm done. Howard, we have plenty, <laughs> we have plenty of time left. Uh, it has been proven that the sentinel node is an accurate predictor of whether or not a tumor has spread to the regional lymph nodes, and there is a reproducible technique we use to check the sentinel node. This is minimally invasive surgery. This is minor surgery. Instead of having to take out the whole regional lymph node in the groin, I can take out just that single node that's identified uh, when we do our sentinel node biopsy. What tells us whether or not we need to do it? Does everyone need to do it? No. 
Patients with melanomas less than one millimeter thick generally don't need a sentinel node biopsy. If you have ulceration, remember ulceration is a factor that worsens the prognosis for every given millimeter measurement. If you have a high mitotic index, remember what that is, that's the number of mitoses seen per millimeter squared by the pathologist. If you have a high mitotic index or ulceration, we lower that lower threshold down to 0.75, and we are starting to be very aggressive about sentinel node biopsy if you have a high mitotic index, no matter what your thickness is. Those are some of the subtleties you'll talk about, but the principle is the thicker the lesion, the more aggressive we are. So the cutoff for sentinel node is generally one millimeter. Bring it back down to 0.75 millimeters if it's ulcerated, or if there's a high mitotic index. Does that make sense? Okay. Pretty soon you can do these consultations. Um, all right, mapping is done for every case. Say we decide you're a candidate for sentinel node biopsy. It is impossible to predict where the sentinel node is based simply on anatomy. One would presume that a sentinel node on the arm, if you're a doctor, you'd presume that a, that a lymph melanoma on the arm would go to the armpit because that's where the nearest regional lymph node basin is. In fact, there's a regional lymph node basin at the elbow, and I don't want to look up here when your sentinel node is here. So every case we do is mapped. So that involves a trip to nuclear medicine. They inject around the site of your tumor or your scar, do an x-ray for me to show me where that part of the body drains to what sentinel node. It doesn't tell me the melanoma is spread, it just tells me what lymph node I should look for. So you make a trip to nuclear medicine if you're going to have a sentinel node biopsy combined with your wide local excision. You then come to the operating room, and that node is, elim is eliminated, is removed in a minimally invasive way, small incision, the rest of the lymph nodes are left in place. And that is really minimally invasive focused surgery, and it has reduced the morbidity and mortality significantly for when we do lymphatic surgery. Uh, it is an outpatient procedure. When we combine sentinel node with wide local excision, we often do it under general anesthesia because it's a fairly long time in the operating room. It often involves changing the position, and it's kind of a lot to put up with if you're anxious and you're having two separate surgical sites. If it were done on me, I'd probably want a general anesthesia, although it can be done with sedation where we start an IV, give you some narcotic and a tranquilizer. By the way, the beauty of the tranquilizer is you don't remember anything. So when people say, will it hurt? I say, yeah, it'll hurt but you won't remember. It's perfect, so what's the difference? When a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, did it make any noise? That's kind of, we can have that philosophical discussion about whether or not it hurts when you take Versed, which is that amnesia-inducing tranquilizer. So sentinel node relates to the tumor thickness, relates to the presence of ulceration, relates to the mitotic index, and if you're a candidate for sentinel node, it's added to your wide local excision. Oops, sorry. All right, so it's minimally invasive, single node, whether uh, multiple nodes are involved, and it identifies patients in whom the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes, and it's from there that we make another series of decisions. Uh, it's based on the understanding that if one node is involved, there's a 20 to 30 percent chance that a second or third node is involved, and as a surgeon, I'm trained to be aggressive, and I still believe that metastatic disease to the regional lymph nodes is curable with the right regional lymph node operation. So if you have a positive sentinel node, you have a second operation planned in the future to remove the rest of the lymph nodes in that regional basin. Does that make sense? Understand? So in the armpit, if I take out one node and it's positive, I take the rest of those lymph nodes out at a second operation. Why a second operation? Because that sentinel node, which is delivered to Dr. Reddy, has to be thin-sectioned, it has to be stained, it has to be examined, and that takes several days. So here's another delay built into the process. The first delay was trying to get your pathology report, get it reviewed by Dr. Reddy. Uh, the second delay is waiting for that sentinel node to be evaluated. So you have this outpatient procedure, wide local excision, sentinel node biopsy, you go home. In two to four days, we get the report from the sentinel node, and if it's positive, it gives us some information. Number one, it gives me new prognostic information so I can answer the questions, Doc, what does this mean in terms of my survival, my recurrence rate, what am I going to be like five years from now, and I can use this information to help craft ac accurate answers. It also tells me that you're at higher risk for recurrence by virtue of the fact that it's spread to the sentinel node, and I can offer you an opportunity to participate in an adjuvant therapy trial. Adjuvant therapy is therapy given to people at high risk for recurrence when they are apparently disease-free. If you have a positive sentinel node, your five-year disease-free survival rate goes from as high as 90% down to as low as 60%, and we would love to have a medicine to give you to make sure that your five-year disease-free survival rate is up in the 90% range. So number one, a positive node allows us to offer you adjuvant trials, and number two, if the standard of care is then to offer you completion lymphadenectomy. Number three, this is an important part of uh, the 
continual evolution of the treatment of melanoma. If you have minimally, uh, minimal volume of disease in your sentinel node, you also have the option of participating in one of the trials that's out there, and it's available in Chicago, where we observe rather than do the dissection, because we're not sure what volume of disease in the sentinel node really casts uh, poor prognostic um, uh, impact on your uh, future versus just represent cells that are there as either a passenger cell or maybe controlled by your immune system. So we are doing a trial where patients with small volumes of sentinel node disease are observed versus dissected. Just something to remember, I use that sentinel node to determine whether or not you need more operation to get rid of the nodes. I use it to answer more accurately your questions about prognosis, and I use it to see if you're a candidate for one of the clinical trials looking at how we can best apply sentinel node technology. Does that make sense? Questions? Sorry? Never give a doctor a pointer that's a laser thing. Okay. Positive sentinel node biopsy. This takes a couple of days. Remember, that's the second delay built into the process. It's an operation that takes place in the hospital under general anesthesia. We keep patients in overnight for pain control, make sure you've recovered nicely from your general anesthesia, and to teach you how to handle the drains we put in place when we do a complete lymph node dissection. It's an uh, operation that's extremely well tolerated, not terribly uncomfortable, and people have figured out how to handle those drains, and they go to the mall and walk or go see movies, et cetera, depending on where the site of surgery is. So it's well tolerated, but it does require an in-hospital stay, stay in a general anesthesia. Metastatic disease, this is where we are very aggressive. Metastatic disease means that the tumor has spread past the regional lymph node to some part in the body, and one of the tricky things about melanoma is it can go anywhere and mimic anything metastasize to the tip of your nose or to the tip of your toes. So we look at the patient's body with CAT scans and PET scans when they have a positive sentinel node. Oftentimes that's negative, so we then assume that we've got a cure. But during the follow-up program, some people develop metastatic disease elsewhere in the body. And the first thing we do is to see whether it's resectable. And that means, can I take it out safely without hurting you? Are you healthy enough to tolerate that surgery? And is it an organ that you can live without? We've done things as dramatic as taking out two-thirds of the liver, uh, we've taken out adrenal glands, we've taken out pieces of intestine one, two, and three times in a given patient. We're very aggressive about this, and the reason we're aggressive about it is there's another trial that was done a while back that has shown that patients with isolated metastatic disease who undergo surgical resection have about a 40 to 50 percent chance of being alive in five years as opposed to a much lesser chance of being alive without the surgery. So we are very aggressive about uh, resecting metastatic disease. And if it's something I'm not comfortable with, I'm in an eight-man surgical group, and I have uh, partners who can help me do just about anything. So we're very aggressive about applying surgery for metastatic disease. And in fact, there's a trial available in Chicago for people with resectable stage four disease uh, where we do the resection and then follow. Um, the other reason we'll do resections of metastatic disease, if you're not completely cured, I mean, if you're not rendered disease-free by the resection, there are some recurrences that cause a lot of symptoms that just destroy the quality of life. And if taking care of those symptoms with a simple surgery, it's nothing simple, but with a surgery that you're going to survive and do well with afterwards, we do operations to improve quality of life for things, for example, that are blocking the intestine or causing pain because of invading one of the cutaneous nerves on the side of the body. So we're very aggressive to apply this resection of metastatic disease as a palliative procedure as well. Um, so we just sort of never say never. We always try to apply an aggressive surgical approach whenever possible. Here's the apples and orange phenomena, which I see all the time. Remember that this treatment and prognosis that I've just talked about is based on understanding the stage of the tumor. An in situ melanoma is highly curable with a simple operation done as an outpatient. You can gulf that afternoon. Metastatic disease to the liver requires pretty dramatic surgery and you're in the hospital for a week. Your friends don't know what your stage is. Your parents don't know what your stage is. Your um, uh, coworkers don't know what your stage is, but they sure know someone who had melanoma, crashed and burned, died in three months, God, it's terrible, goodbye. They don't know your microstage, so I tell everyone, if you get that kind of news, call me. And I tell them that what I'm telling you is probably more accurate than your good intention friends are telling you. So these melanomas that are thin are very different than melanomas that are thick. So keep that in mind when you're interacting with your friends who are trying to give you good advice. Um, call your doctor if you have any questions, or you can call me. That is my phone number. Um, and you can call any time. And I would close simply by saying thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. Remember, you're part of this team, uh, a valued member of the team. So let's keep interacting with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you.